morning. Welcome to our prayer and Bible study. Take your hymnals and turn to 428. Nothing between my soul and the Savior. Sandy to sing 428. prayer you know, that there'd be nothing between us and our Savior. What an opportunity tonight to gather and talk to God. Let's, let's pray at this time. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can come before you tonight, and I pray that the song we just sang would be true in our hearts and lives. Lord, in the middle of a week, it is so easy to be burdened down with cares, with sorrows, with temptations. Pray, Lord, that we'd pause. And if there's anything between you and us tonight, that we would confess that, forsake that, take that anxiety, that burden, and cast it upon you, that, that we would leave here this evening encouraged, refreshed, and joyful in knowing that we have a God who rules and reigns in the heavens, who's powerful and who works all things for our good and works in our behalf. Lord, I pray that that would encourage us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So glad that you are here this evening. And if you did not get a handout, go ahead and make your way to the back or put your hand up and uh, Taylor will get it to you. But we've got two whole sheets tonight and go on to a third page that's because there's 50 verses in Psalm 18 
Uh, we may not make it through all 50 verses this evening, um, but we are going to start in a moment in Psalm 17. And Psalm 17 is a prayer for justice. You think about our world right now, wow, we need to pray for justice, don't we? Whether it be the war that is taking place in Ukraine and uh, the millions of people who have been displaced by that, whether it is um, the plight of the unborn, uh, perhaps in our society at large with families and marriages and employees and employers, we live in a world that needs justice. And David is going to start with this, this prayer, just kind of crying out to God, you know, we, we need you, Lord. And one of the things about trials is it reminds us how much we need him and how dependent we really are. So let's walk through Psalm, 50, excuse me, Psalm 17 together, and then we'll look at Psalm 18 in a few minutes. Hear the right, O Lord. Attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. Hear my claim and my plea for righteousness. Hear the right. Hear, hear my, my claim of what's really right, of judgment and justice and righteousness. It's not going out of lying lips. Verse 2, let my sentence... You know, a judge renders a verdict. He gives a sentence of guilt or innocence. Let my sentence come forth from thy presence. I want you to be the one who judges either for or against me in my behalf. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. See what is equitable and fair and just. Thou hast proved my heart, a term like a saying metal. You've, you've put me in the fire and you've tried me, and you've seen what's on the inside. Thou hast visited me in the night, and hast tried me. You've, you've interrogated me through the night watch, and shalt find nothing. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. So ultimately, what's David asking for here? Justice, Justice. Justice from God. For God to hear his prayer, his plea. I want vindication. I want righteousness. Now, that doesn't mean that David is sinless and perfect, but that means David is going through some kind of struggle or trial or conflict or difficulty where he feels like he's either being misjudged, falsely accused. Um, I need God to work in this difficulty. And we sometimes face that in life. What's the basis of him asking for God to judge him? What's he claiming about himself? What do you see in those verses? I'm upright, I'm righteous, you put me under the microscope and you'll find I'm not guilty of whatever it is they're claiming that I'm guilty of. I am, we would use this word, wouldn't we? Innocent. I'm innocent, God. And I know it, and you know it. Isn't it great to be able to pillow your head at night with a clean conscience? And that's a wonderful thing. There, there are many people in our world that do not enjoy that privilege. And they could. <laughs> they could do some things where they could enjoy that. But here's David, and he's saying, God, you examine me, you see me, you try me, you investigate me. I'm not, I'm not crying out to you with lying, fake, fraudulent lips. I'm innocent, and I've been wronged. I was uh, talking to um, a former church member here who, who I learned this week had uh, lost their job, and I was talking to him today, and best I can tell, he, he had lost that job, but he doesn't know why, he wasn't told why, but, but it sounds like probably in an unjust fashion. And here's someone that in their heart can cry, I believe I'm innocent. And yet that's still a struggle, isn't it? And as we think about the politically incorrect world in which we live, as people perhaps are a witness for Christ in their workplace or take a stand for truth and righteousness, there could be situations where false accusation comes. 
And we, isn't it great that we have a God we can appeal to? And so, so David cries out on the basis that he believes that he's innocent. And how do we know when we should take matters into our own hands or when we should leave it to God? I thought of this question because as David was fleeing from Saul, he had a couple opportunities to kill him, but he didn't. You remember that? In the cave. And he didn't say, I'm not going to stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. Isn't, isn't one of the challenging questions that we often face in life as we think about this question of innocence, when do I take matters in my own hands and when do I cry out and pray for justice? Isn't that a hard question to answer sometimes? So let me give you a couple that I thought of and then maybe if you've got a couple others you want to add to that. One would be the area of revenge. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It is an easy temptation to take revenge, isn't it? Man, we want to get even, we want to settle the score, we want to set things right. And by set things right, we mean inflict as much pain, harm, and hurt on them as they did on me. And yet God tells us to love our enemies and bless those that curse us and do good to those that despitefully use us. And so when we do that, what are we doing? When, you know the, the passage in Romans 12 where you do good to those who have done evil to you and you heap coals of fire on their head and you pray for them and you treat them well and you give them food in their time of need. And in all of that, there's this underlying faith that we are leaving vengeance to who? So it's not that, that justice needs to be wink, wink, just passed over and we'll just ignore that and you get the short end of the stick and you just have to live with it. It's that we are entrusting God to execute that revenge in the time and the way that he sees best. Now, the way we can sometimes coach him up on, hey, God, how about this? <laughs> and the time we sometimes don't want to wait on. But one thing that we know we should give over to God and not take into our own hands is the matter of revenge. And that can be really hard when someone hurts you. Um, a second would be exalting ourselves. On the flip side of that coin, when we do something that is wrong, think about James chapter 4. Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Purge your hands, you sinners. Cleanse your hearts, ye, ye double-minded. Weep, mourn, be afflicted, and what does the verse say? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he shall lift you up. There are just circumstances where we're like, now this isn't fair. This isn't right, what's happening to me right now. They don't understand how innocent I am, or how sorry I am, or how, you know, I'm, I, I'm the parent, they're the child, I'm the this, I'm the that, how, how they should be treating, reacting, responding, whatever, feeling like... And what are we trying to do? Oftentimes, say oftentimes, sometimes, I've been guilty, maybe you have too, of in somebody else's eyes trying to lift myself up. Well, I will just fix this. I will let them know how they should view and treat me. And that can bleed over into anger, into forcing situations, into manipulation, into so many different things. And what does God say? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will what? Lift you up. That's a faith decision, isn't it? And so I think about some of my reactions sometimes of certain situations, and I need to ask myself, am I clothed with humility in this moment? There may be action I need to take and things I need to do, but am I doing it in a spirit of humility, or am I doing it in a spirit of pride and anger? He will lift me up. And so, those are two, you know, we, we, we pray this prayer, you've perhaps heard it said to pray this prayer, that God, give me the wisdom to know, you know, what I can change and what I can't, and the humility to accept what I can't, and the courage to, do, to change what I can, and I'm, I'm, I'm butchering that. You, but you know what I'm saying here. That's one of the challenges of life. What are some others that you would say, 
things that I turn over to God and things that are responsibilities that I have to fulfill. Uh, are there others that come to mind that you guys can think of? That, that it's kind of that challenge to work through sometimes. Yes, Marion. Okay, the saving of a soul. And so that tension of what's our, what's our part of that equation? Okay, to witness, to love, to point people to God, to de declare the gospel, to show people their need, that they're sinners, and that Christ is a solution and the answer, to proclaim, to talk, to pray, to pray for the lost. In fact, we're commanded multiple times to pray for laborers. That's another one to pray for. In fact, I think we're commanded more times to pray for laborers than we're commanded to pray for the lost, which is amazing if you stop and think about that. So, okay, there are responsibilities that we have, and then God, the Holy Spirit, convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and He works in the heart of the unbeliever to convince of truth. And so, okay, what else? Abiding. Abiding is our responsibility. Without me, ye can do nothing. Obedience, when he gives us clear commands, that's our responsibility. So there are, there are things that we know, but so our, is our approach to life in, in a secret sense in our heart, it's almost pragmatic, results-oriented. To me, it's it's like, okay, I'll do this if I see the results. No, I'll do this and leave the results to God, like on the witnessing side. We don't wait to witness until we have a good measure of confidence the person will actually believe. Otherwise, we might be waiting a long time. And, and so in that balance, it is entrusting to God, okay, I'm going to walk in faith and obedience and humility and trust you to do what you said you will. So for David, this deals in the area of his life, specifically of guarding against temptation and the wrong path. Look at the next couple of verses, starting in verse 4. Concerning the works of men, the normal behavior and habits of men, the sins of men, by the word of thy lips I have kept me from the path of the destroyer. I have, through God's word, his guidance, his revelation, and his direction kept from certain steps. Specifically, the paths of the destroyer. I'm not robbing, plundering, abusing. Hold my goings in thy paths that my footsteps slip not. It's interesting. David's prayer for justice, where he's crying out for the plea for God to judge. Ultimately, when it comes to people walking the right path, he starts with who? Himself. God, help me to walk in a right path. Justice begins with you. I mean, me. Justice begins with me. Help me, Lord. Guide me, Lord. Preserve me, Lord. Protect me, Lord. Help me to reject temptation, to be faithful. Start with me. I have called upon thee. For thou wilt hear me, O God, incline thine ear unto me, and hear my speech. So what was it that gave David confidence going forward? We know it was God's word that was delivering him from the path of destruction and ruin. What was it that gave him confidence? God's going to hear me. God's going to answer my prayer. Specifically, starting with what prayer? To keep my footsteps from slipping or falling to protect me from sin and temptation to help me walk in the path of justice and righteousness. God's going to hear my prayer. I'm going to be able to stand before him innocent. I'm going to have this vindication. And so when we come to God, it's hopefully with the hope that we think he's actually going to hear and what? Answer our prayer. And that's what keeps us going, right? Verse 7, show thy marvelous loving kindness 
Distinguish it. Make it known. Your mercy, your blessing, your covenant faithfulness. O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee, from those that rise up against them. God, show up. We need you. Show your covenant faithfulness. This, this attribute of your hesed, your, your, your promise-keeping nature that you've put on display in the past when you've come and you've put your arm and your might and your power on display. So think about in the chronology of the Old Testament where David's at. He's about 1,000 B.C. What has happened in Israel's history before David that would be moments of God's faithfulness and power showing up to deliver his people those who put their trust in them from those that rise up against them and seek to oppress and destroy them. Give me some examples. Okay, we got Egypt, the Red Sea, the Judges. So we, we think about our prayer lives. This, this was something that a commentator put in. I thought this was awesome. The, the concepts that David is praying here show up in another song, a song that was written well before David's. In Exodus chapter 15, where the children of Israel are celebrating the horse and rider and Pharaoh and his army being cast into the sea, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, who is like thee, nobody, because he's the only one, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Show us your marvelous, your wondrous loving kindness, doing wonders. Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy, your covenant faithfulness, your love, thy mercy has led forth, I'm assuming that's the same concept, led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. You know what David's doing? He's praying scripture back to God. He's singing out of the songbook that he had. It was a much smaller one because he's writing a bunch of them. Look at the next verse. Psalm 17, 8. Keep me as the apple of thy eye. Keep me as the one who is the focus of your tender love and care. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Protect me as the mother bird does its chicks or bears up. What's David doing? Deuteronomy 32. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the, what's the next phrase, everybody? Apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them up, and beareth them on her wings. You know what David's doing? He's praying scripture back to God. He's not saying, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Because Elijah hasn't come along yet. You know what he's saying? Where is the Lord God of Moses and Joshua? Where is that God who opened up oceans and rivers and cast down cities? He, in his right hand and his might and his power, delivered them in that day because he's a faithful, promise-keeping, covenant-keeping, merciful God who cares and is tender-hearted towards those that trust in him. Hey, that's me too, God. I love you. I care about you. I trust you. Where are you? I need you. So we're not the first generation to pray, where is the Lord God of... Right? And so here's David praying scripture back to God. So what's David's problem? Look at verse 9 and following. For the wicked, you know, deliver me and protect me from the, from the wicked that oppress me. They're powerful. They're surrounding from my deadly enemies who compass me about. They are enclosed in their own fat. They are prosperous, and they are actually prosperous at the goodness of God that is rained upon all men. And they don't even know where their prosperity comes from. With their mouth, they speak proudly. They're arrogant. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth like a lion that is greedy of his prey. He wants to rip me to pieces. He wants to take his talons and his fangs and his claws and shred me. 
as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. They're waiting to ambush me, God. They're greedy hunters pouncing. You mentioned Ukraine. There's, you know, obviously some similarities here. You know what, you know what David's asking for? Justice. Vindication, protection, deliverance. I'm innocent, God. I trust you. I'm the apple of your eye. Remember what you did at the Red Sea. Remember what you did and you took him through the wilderness. Remember what you did with Joshua, God. I need you. Arise, O Lord. Disappoint him. Cast him down. Deliver my soul from the wicked which is thy sword. And the witches is italicized. So, so could this, this could have the idea, deliver my soul from the wicked, thy sword. You, you use your sword to do it. Verse 14, from men which are thy hand. From men, thy hand, O Lord. From men of the world, which have their portion in this life. From men who are greedy like those lions, and they're just trying to get stuff and treasure and possessions, and they are living for the material and for the moment, and because of their greed and their covetousness, they're walking in wickedness. Again, you think about the wars and the violence and the injustice. Think about all the cities in our country that were burned over the last few years. People who were rioting and angry and all of this and Would you say that greed has played a role in any of that? Absolutely. You think if, if Planned Parenthood weren't making a profit killing babies, they'd be as intense about women's rights? You know, there's the old saying, follow the money. And here's David, he's saying, the people of this world whose belly thou fillest with hid treasure, they are full of children, they leave the rest of their substance to their babies, they have all of this abundance and they have absolutely no idea really where it's coming from. What's amazing to me in this is that it, God is good to men. Even to those, which is all of us, who don't deserve it. Let me ask you a question. How does God's goodness give hope to your prayers? Okay, he's going to give us what's best for us. Okay, whether it's suffering for his name or that could be chastening as well. Correction of the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And it's never fun when you're going through it. So how does that give hope to your prayers? God, in what I'm going through right now, help me to remember that you are gentle and that you are pure and that you are peaceful and that you are merciful, divine wisdom. Tammy? Did you have your hand up? It looked like you did. Okay, I thought you were waving at me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Anybody else? How does God's goodness give hope to your prayers? Okay, he wants to answer them. He isn't miserly, okay? Okay? Makes you want to pray again when you see an answer, okay? Did you have your hand up, Jim? Okay. Yeah, however that prayer gets answered, all right? So I can trust him even when I don't get what I hoped, perhaps, or expected, or thought that I would get. Or when, that's an excellent point. So keep praying. You know, Jim made the point last week. Keep knocking. Why? Because he's good. That's why. Don't give up. Don't quit. Ask, seek, knock. But what are we asking and seeking and knocking for? 
Look at verse 15 as we round out the psalm. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I, unlike the wicked of the world who are beneficiaries of all this goodness, but aren't satisfied with the stuff they have and are full of greed and are lions seeking to pounce upon their prey because they want more, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied not with the stuff of this world when I awake with thy likeness. Whether that means he awakens from trouble and sees God's deliverance, or he awakens in the morning and has confidence that God is there, or he awakens as one who comes to his senses, or he awakens in the resurrection to find that God is real and not a ghost is the idea, to know his form. And isn't that the ultimate bottom line of what we want? God, I want to know that you are real to me, to my kids, to my family. that I'm satisfied with him and with knowing him and with knowing his face. And so the question that we, we close Psalm 17 with is this, what is it that will satisfy your soul? And what are you hunting for? Am I the lion hunting for more to fill my covetousness or am I hunting for God's righteousness and likeness so I can come to look like him? Psalm 17, God Bring justice. Start with me. We need you. Now, we're going to step into Psalm 18 here. Thank God for, well, there's all kinds of good gifts we can thank him for, but thank God for God. That's a great place to start. Let's thank God for himself. And so as we do tonight, I have a little assignment for you. Hopefully you've got a pen that you can use along with the handout. If not, uh, you will not be able to complete the assignment. Uh, there are some pens in the usher's closet in the back. Um, I have one here if somebody needs a pen. Uh, here's what I'd like you to do. And I'll walk through a few verses here and then let you guys have a couple minutes to work on this. Uh, I'm going to suggest maybe you start near the end of the psalm and then whenever we don't get through in the next few minutes, um, you can do if you want to at home on your own. This is a psalm written... I love the preface here, of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Man, this had to be a good day. I've been hunted for years, and I am now delivered from the hand of Saul and from all my enemies. Probably shortly after Ziklag here, where he encourages himself in the Lord, perhaps gets his family back. I don't know the exact timing, but this was a good day. So David is going to go through here, and what I'd like you to do is read through this psalm and take a few moments and circle the attributes of God that you see, underline the works of God that you see, put a little box around the troubles of David, and put a little asterisk towards David's, by David's actions towards God. Now, I was not able to do that conveniently on the screen, so I'll show you what I'm talking about. I actually did a little bit different technique. So the all caps are the attributes of God. The underline, instead of an asterisk that I put on the screen, you, you wouldn't be able to do all caps, obviously, in the text you already have on the page. Uh, the the uh, underline is David's action towards God. And, and to, to walk through like three or four verses here and then give you guys a few minutes to work through like verse 7 in the next, next several verses. And he said... I will love thee. That's an action of David towards God. O oh Lord, why? My strength. That's an attribute of God. The Lord is my rock. That's an attribute of God. And my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength. And here's his action. I love you. Whom I will trust. I trust you, my buckler, my, my shield, the horn of my salvation, the strength and power of my salvation, my high tower, my fortress. All these terms of God's strength and deliverance and protection and might and majesty, these are attributes of God. I will call upon the Lord. Well, I guess so. If he's all that... 
If he's strength and rock and fortress and deliverer and strength and buckler and horn of salvation and high tower, I will call upon the Lord. Not only will I love him, not only will I trust him, I'm going to pray to him. Who's worthy to be praised? He's the real deal. So shall I be saved from mine enemies through praying and calling upon this almighty, all-powerful God. What were some of the problems David faced? On the screen, I put them in bold. It would be something that he would put a box around. The sorrows of death compassed me. Sorrow. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. I'm drowning here, God. I'm afraid. I'm running for my life. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. I'm surrounded. There's no escape. The snares of death. So I, I, put, I, I would you know, put boxes around those different ones. This is what David's going through. Then the earth shook and trembled. This is a, a work of God. So I'd underline that phrase. The earth sh shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken. So it, it, and on the screen, I highlighted it instead of underlining it. Because he was wroth. He was angry. There's another attribute of God. So I'm going to stop right there. And I want you guys to take a few minutes. I'll give you uh, just a couple. Go through the handout. Underline, circle, put an asterisk. If you haven't got handouts, they're in the back on the little lectern in the back. I think we've got some. We do not. We are out of handouts. Never mind. Strike that. Obviously, if you don't have a handout, you could use your Bible. We're in Psalm 18. I really want to make this feel like a, a school assignment. We could have a pop quiz here in a minute.
All right, pop quiz, name at least one attribute of God you see in this psalm. We got rock. Merciful. So as we as we pick up here in verse uh, seven, David called, David loved, David trusted. Look at how this look at how this psalm unfolds. And I don't know where you're at. And again, we may not get all the way through it, but you can do the rest at another time if if you'd like. I cried and I'm in distress, and God's angry. He was wroth, and because he's wroth, the earth shakes, the hills move. Then went up smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. God's at work. God's coming. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed down the heavens also and came down. This, these are the works of God, and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. God is bringing the storm clouds upon his enemies. And the brightness that was before him, the thick clouds passed. Hail of stones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens. And the highest, I could put that in all caps. There's no one higher than God. The highest gave his voice. Hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Is God at work here? The channels of the waters were seen. The foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord. God laid things bare before him at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. God is defeating and destroying David's enemies. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me. Out of many waters, he delivered me. So this, this becomes intensely personal. And what are some of the things that he was delivered from? It's in the bold text on the screen, so it's hard to see. But as you went through, what, what did you see when you were maybe identifying some of David's troubles here when you were boxing this? What, what do you see? Give me several that you see here. From the... Strong enemy, what did you say? Yeah. Ungodly, they which hated me, those that were too strong for me. Have you ever had an opponent, an opposition, a challenge, a difficulty? There's somebody that hates me. There's somebody that's out to get me. They're too strong for me. They're a strong enemy. They've got either position or resources that I don't have. They have strength that I don't have. Who do you need? God. They prevented me in the day of my calamity. They went before me. That's the idea, I believe, there. In the day of my calamity. So in the day of calamity, the Lord was attribute of God. As our stay, he brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. So he expanded his opportunity. He delivered him. He delighted in him. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. That could be underlined, right? Or asterisked, And have not wickedly departed from my God. So what I wanted you to see as you read through this psalm, because I knew we weren't going to necessarily walk through it in detail, is, is the give and take, the relationship, the tension between David and his God, 
who's, here's who I am. Here's what I've done. I'm going to call upon you. I'm going to seek you. You've rewarded me. You've seen the innocency of my hands. You've delivered me from my enemies. You're my stay and my fortress and my strength and my high tower and my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. And so I'm going to cry out to you. I'm going to trust you. You came and delivered when I needed you. For all his judgments were before me. He showed me right from wrong. I did not put away his statutes from me. You could put an asterisk after asterisk here. I was also upright before him. I kept myself from iniquity. I said, no to sin. I resisted temptation. And God saw all that. When I was here in the cave and not killing and running, and these men were coming to me, think about who were David's mighty men to start with? They were debtors. They were a kind of a rough crowd who were the outcasts of society, kind of looking for a place to belong, running for their own lives as well. And David says, let us serve the Lord together. If David is someone who has a complaining, griping, murmuring, self-pity type spirit, and these men come to him, what do you think that cave is going to be like? What do you think they're going to do to the surrounding populace when they're hungry and they want food? What do you think they're going to do to Nabal's sheep shearers? David is saying he, he, he lived his life in such a way that these men became mighty men because they knew God and they learned to trust him. Think about what's taking place in the secret place of that cave. And David's here claiming, you saw all this, God. It wasn't a pity party. It wasn't a gripe fest. It wasn't a complaining, yeah, Saul. That was that it. Because if it was, they wouldn't have turned out that way. And they're like, yeah, let's get revenge. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He's the God who what? Who sees. He sees what I'm at. He sees what I'm going through. He sees the secret conduct of my heart. He sees when I'm living for him and nobody else knows it. He sees that. He's God. He's... What... what what's... What... Speaks to you from these phrases about God. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. With the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. What speaks to you from those verses? What, what about God rings to you from those phrases? He's just. He's fair. He'll do right by you. He'll be merciful to you. If you're doing right by others and are merciful to others... But if you're lying, deceptive, cruel, the froward, you can anticipate hardship. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. I am in this cave, I am in this affliction, I am in this difficulty, I'm surrounded, I'm drowning in the, the storm and ocean and waves of all this affliction. You're my light in the darkness, God. Now, I underlined these, but I could have also highlighted them, right? If you stop and think about this for a second, by the time we get to this part of the psalm, this is stuff that David does but it starts with the phrase, for by thee. So this is also stuff that God does, right? I mean, we could have highlighted and said, this is the work of God. Or we could have a little asterisk to it next to it and said, well, this is what David's doing. I don't know what you did when you were, you know, if you, you know, what you put next to it when you were going through the psalm. But just look at these phrases for a second. For by thee I have run through a troop. I made what I, I, I just cut like a hot knife through butter through the enemy army. And by my God have I leaped over a wall. I have overcome this difficulty. You know, what, you know what David is saying here? The work of God is working in and on me, and it's changing me, and I am able to do things that I would not 
otherwise been able to do because of the work of God. As for God, His way is, the word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in Him. I'll, I'll just do a couple more verses and then we'll stop. For who is God save the Lord? Who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength. So this is God's working, but it's David who has this strength. He maketh my way perfect. So I highlighted this because it's a little more passive, but it still involves what? Both of them. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. He setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. Man, that's amazing. You know, I, I am, I don't think I've ever shot a bow of steel. I've done like wooden fiberglass and like recurve and compounds or that kind of thing. And you've seen people, you know, they got a 50 pound draw or 100 pound draw or 150 pound draw with a rest on the compound. I have never personally witnessed anybody take a bow of steel and snap it. I think if that arrow was flying at you, you'd know it. That's the power of God. Right? You've taught my hands to war. David was not a wimp. Like, why do you think his son Absalom rested and feared him even when he was an old man? Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy, and this word just jumps off the page at me, and thy gentleness. For someone who's been living in a cave for a couple of years, and I know it wasn't a cave the whole time, he was fleeing, he was running, he was a sick lag, he was like, okay, okay, I get it. But you know what I mean when I say, you know, he, for someone who's been living in distress for a couple of years. Here's David's ass assessment of his heavenly father. Thy gentleness hath made me great. I can be gentle with Saul. You've been gentle with me. That's our God. So as we go to prayer, let's remember him. I, I want to just feast on some of those attributes and workings and responses and tension. And so I think for tonight, we'll bypass our second song and go to our, our prayer time. Go ahead and take your, your bulletins. Your bulletins, sorry, your prayer sheets. And a couple that I want to add um, to the prayer sheet, and then we'll mention uh, some praises here and some different things. Um, from the Talbert, from Don Talbert, his friend Ham Griffin has cancer, so he's asked prayer for that. I'm not sure if these are on the sheet or not, so I wanted to mention these. Uh, Ham Griffin, pray for, um, I just lost it. Okay, Drew Slaughter, which is another friend that they have, uh, a, a gentleman in his 40s at MD Anderson with cancer. Uh, for Don's back, for continued healing for him, and then for their daughter, Laurel Mathis. Laura had surgery that went well on Monday regarding some intestinal or gut problems, but she still needs healing, so pray for their daughter, Laurel Mathis, and for her healing. And so I wanted to mention those. Um, praise the Lord that Frances' surgery went well. And uh, for her, pray for her recovery. Uh, and so praise the Lord for that. Uh, just pray, continue to pray for the Burgies, for Nathaniel. I'm sure he's on here somewhere. Um, he, the chemo treatment that he's hoping to have has seven different drugs in it. It turns out he was allergic to one of them. And so they've had to pull that out of the regimen. And they're just praying that he's not allergic to any more of them so that it doesn't impact the regimen. And so pray for him. Pray for their healing, his healing, the finances, the family plans, 
uh, regarding the trip this summer that uh, as we approach them about that here in the next few days, God will give wisdom on that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and so pray specifically for him tonight as he's not feeling well. Um, for the Vinokurovs, our missionaries in Central Asia and in Russia, they were at one point thinking they were going to be transitioning to the States to take on a work in Virginia Beach, but they are currently in Russia and have been there for quite some time now and anticipate that they may be staying there. The church that they're uh, serving with there is growing, and it's grown to such a point that they're needing to find another building or expand their building because they're running out of space. So praise the Lord for the growth problem. Pray that God will give them wisdom about how to handle that problem. Uh, and so uh, pray for them if you would. Um, other, other praises or prayer requests tonight? In the back with Julie. Just an update. Thank you for praying for my uh, my friend's cousin Bryson. He actually was granted the insurance flight to Atlanta by Thursday last week, and so he's out of critical care and has been in therapy sessions like four hours a day. So they're training him how to dress himself, brush his teeth, feed himself. He's taking three meals a day now, and he's learning how to use his voice again. So now it's trying to get his body to work the way that it's supposed to work. So thank you for praying. Okay. Steve True. Yes, my wife Delia is having eye surgery tomorrow morning. Uh, it's a very delicate type of surgery. Pray for success. Eye surgery tomorrow morning. Okay. Tony? Our neighbors who live behind us um, are from Ukraine, and uh, they are Christians. Um, but Yuri uh, and his wife Elena have relatives still in Ukraine, and uh, he has a brother and a sister that live just south of the border of Belarus. And um, just uh, would appreciate, he would appreciate our prayers that the Lord would preserve them, protect them from the Russian invasion that is out in the western part, but uh, uh, they're still vulnerable even out there. Okay. On page two of our prayer sheet for the Messers in Ecuador, as they ordained the first deacon in their church, praise the Lord for that and for some one-on-one -on -one discipleship opportunities. Pray for the Akaret family who will be transitioning in to help them and for their daughter who's going to be moving to the U.S. for college in the fall on their upcoming plans for furlough. So pray for them if you would. Uh, for our friends and relatives with cancer, please continue to pray for these. Did someone have an update on Alethea Wilt? It seems like I heard one offered recently, but I, yes. Hold on just a second. Kevin's coming with a microphone. Her first scans um, were good. Um, she continues with treatment, but um, last week she had a reaction to a bandage. Her, her body broke out in a terrible rash. That has cleared up a little bit, but now she's has some sort of infection with her wound. Um, it's turned yellow, and the doctors are concerned about getting that cleared up. And if you look at the second page of our prayer sheet in the second column, Alethea is the seven-year-old listed there. So pray for that wound to heal. Up here with Shanda. And as Jim is making his way, there are several ladies in our church who are expecting, and so pray for their pregnancies and for good health and protection for them and for their babies in that regard. Shanda. Uh, my mom texted me this afternoon that my uncle Greg Flanagan, um, his wife, my Aunt Carrie took him to the emergency room this morning because he's been having some problems with uh, diverticulitis. 
and this is his second time with it being this serious. They went ahead and admitted him. Um, he's had has a lot of inflammation going on, and they were going to have him talk to a surgeon, and that was the last she'd heard at that point. Okay. So. Salvation and spiritual needs. Uh, be praying for Easter as it's coming up, opportunities for our church family to be a witness. Uh, reach for more prayer requests, neighbors, does anyone have any, anyone they'd like to add to the salvation list? Um, this, uh, on our list here, we have Audrey listed. We have Audrey and, and her boyfriend coming over for dinner this weekend. And so if you pray for the opportunity to share the gospel with them, please, um, that would be on Saturday night. So if, if you would pray for that, we'd appreciate it. Others. Others. For our college students, some are on spring break, some are in midterms. Be praying about those uh, different needs and situations for our military. Um, Michelle Myers is doing better, and so praise the Lord for that. Pray for her continued strength and health. For the war, for justice. Pray for justice in our land and in our world and righteousness and vindication of God's people and... Um, Pastor, Pastor. Yes. Robbie. Back on the uh, salvation spiritual needs, my cousin Michael Franklin for salvation. Okay, is that already on the list? It is not. Okay. I need to add, I need to get him added. Um, but also, if I can just shift gears on another physical need, uh, a real estate agent I did a deal with a couple months ago named Chris DeWitt, he's a believer, um, is battling sepsis and battling for his life, the sepsis infection. Just pray for Chris DeWitt for healing. And this, uh, this brother in Christ that lost his job, just pray that the Lord would guide in the new job opportunities he's seeking and give wisdom in that. And so pray for that if you would, please. Others? Other prayer requests? Anybody? Or praises? For Tony Johnson, on the last page, his continued recovery, um, we have a lady who emailed into the church uh, named Charlotte who's asked prayer for her daughter Kayla that has been experiencing undiagnosed pain for over a year. Uh, so pray for Charlotte and pray for her daughter Kayla. And... Uh, um, that's just a contact that has come to us. And so pray for that if you would. Pray for Tommy Tompkins, John Lever's cousin. Um, is John here? Oh, there's John. So we'll do John and then we'll do Heather. Actually, since Jim's walking back there, Heather, you go ahead. Um, okay, this is kind of a lighter note, but um, I wanted to thank God for my washer and dryer. I really feel like I need to do this even at church so you guys can hear. But yeah, just... The short thing is, I was praying for a washer and dryer. I decided I needed to pray for one. <laughs> um, and Luke and I, well, I didn't tell anybody, but then Luke did mention it in teen class. But that was a God thing because the Routens happened to notice on Facebook that somebody they were connected to was trying to get rid of a perfectly good washer and dryer. And they used to go here, I guess, and um, they said they weren't charging for it. They, would, uh, they actually delivered it to my apartment didn't charge, and then the Routens came the other night and hooked it up and brought the stuff they needed to hook up because I didn't even think that you need stuff to hook it up with. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it was just amazing, and we were Luke and I were praying together, and Luke was amazed. I was so excited to tell him about it, and he was really amazed that we prayed for a washer and dryer, and God gave us, you know, them. So that was just a huge praise. I just want to thank God for that because he completely arranged that. So that's it. Amen. Amen. John? Okay, no update on Tommy. All right. So continue to pray for him. Pray for Phil Cantrell. This is a missionary friend of the uh, Petersons in Russia, and they haven't really heard a lot of word, and uh, the um, mission agency is keeping some things tight to the, the vest there, and so just pray for them. Anything you'd like to add to that? Okay. Anybody else? Jim? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say that Tony went to the doctor today, and uh, he cleared him to go to work on Monday, uh, but he's still on a soft and liquid diet. 
for some time now. So thank you for praying. Also for DeWitt Steele, uh, Don Tolbert's cousin, hospitalized with severe seizures, I believe. He's home now, uh, but continue to pray for him. The Wakefield family at, um, that's Marty's boss who passed away. And the good news there is based on some things that Marty learned at the funeral or you know, with conversations surrounding the funeral, uh, he has a higher degree of confidence of, of Jay's salvation, if I'm remembering correctly. And so praise the Lord for that. Anybody else? Sarah? Um, I know the like teens and youth group are on the list, but I would just like to ask that we specifically pray for our teens and our youth group that they would love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, because there's just so much that they face every day, um, and just that they would pursue a relationship with Jesus. And uh, one more, if you all would pray for Daniel and Drashko. Daniel um, trusted Christ after the service on Sunday and just to help him in his spiritual walk and his growth as he begins his journey with God and so, or continues his journey with God, but that God would help him to grow spiritually. So pray for Daniel if you would. Um, I have one more. I thought BBN was on here, um, but as I was looking through, they're still traveling. The conference is um, finished up or should be finishing up today. Um, good success on those. Um, Pastor Privet should be traveling back pretty soon. And then Dad and Pastor Miller keep going on um, into different areas. I think Dad's going into Andhra Pradesh, and then Pastor Miller is going up into um, Ukrul, and they've just kind of divided up between different locations. So if you just keep um, Vision 2020 in prayer. Okay, pray for them and their India trip. Right, anybody else? Anybody else? All right, if you would, uh, take some time and pray, men with men, ladies with ladies, as couples, uh, and uh, just cry out to our great God.